Well, greetings Ambassador Kamal and our guest of honor, Mr. Mar Nasser, who is Director of the Outreach Division of the United Nations Department of Public Information. Um, we also would like to welcome our academic friends and partners uh, participating in today's video conference. They are Bronx Community College, Lehigh University, Mercy College, Towson University, FDU Vancouver, FDU Florham, and FDU Teaneck. It is indeed an honor for us to have Mr. Nasser as our guest today. He has more than 23 years of work experience in the United Nations system. Um, and this includes his current post as director of the outreach division in the Department of Public Information. There's also something new and very interesting. He was recently designated as acting director of the Department of Public Information. So Mr. Nasser is, is wearing two very big hats at the United Nations. Um, FDU works very closely with Mr. Nasser's department. In 2010, we served as a member of UNDPI's annual NGO conference, planning team, and chair for the Youth Pre Conference for the global conference Mr. Nasser's department held in Melbourne, Australia. And we are currently serving as a director for the DPI related NGO executive committee. So we are particularly pleased to have Mr. Nasser here with us today in light of our close working relationship with his department. Ambassador Kamal, I now turn over the session to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you uh, and with all your partner universities, and a greater pleasure to have as our guest and panelist, uh, Mr. Nasser. Mr. Nasser, as you rightly said, wears two hats. Uh, one, which is a large sombrero, which is as the head of DPI, uh, currently after the departure of the Under Secretary General. So he is, in a way, the acting Under Secretary General and head of the Department of Public Information. And then, of course, he also has a smaller uh, sombrero, which is that as director of outreach in the uh, in the department in the division. <clears throat> and so, it's a pleasure, sir, to have you here at this table. My pleasure. Uh, that being said, uh, I would like to lead into the subject by uh, giving you a short background of the department of outreach. The the de not the department, but DPI first, as a whole. DPI is a very large department because it is 700 plus uh, people of whom almost half are in the field. And so these are not people uh, sitting at headquarters and having endless cups of coffee. These are people who are actually working in the field. And the headquarters part of uh, the department is making the planning and the policy which is then to be followed uh, out in the field and in the member states. And so the question really is, what is the work that is being done, particularly in the member states? Because part of it is the building up of a proper image of the United Nations. But the United Nations, if it is doing good work, then it does not need too much image building. If, on the other hand, it is not doing good work, then image building will be more or less a negative or an unsuccessful objective because you are never going to be able to sell an apple which is not quite ripe and tasty. And so the question that I would like to address first of all to Mr. Mahir Nasir is you are literally sitting at the top of a very large department, if not the largest department in the United Nations. I think there's a contest between three departments, the, the Department of Public Information, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and the Department of uh, Peacekeeping, which has been divided into two parts, and so uh, it has lost out in the numbers game. But obviously, the question of the image of the United Nations is of primary importance. Otherwise, there's been no justification for the, such a large department. And so the question is, why does the United Nations need so much effort in building up its image? And how successful have you been 
in convincing people around the world, particularly those who are in think tanks like universities, that the work that is being done by the United Nations is really worth it and it is cost, uh, cost the cost-benefit ratio is good because we all know that the United Nations is working at a pittance. The amount of money that is being spent on the UN is really nothing. The United States, which is a major pillar of the UN, is contributing less than the cost of one subway token to the United Nations per person per year. And so it is literally nothing. And so, question for you, sir, first on the whole and then on the outreach. What are you up to? What is your mandate? What are your primary objectives? Mm -hmm. And how successful are you in achieving them? The floor is yours. Thank you, and I would like to take the opportunity first to thank you for the invitation and also to thank all the participating universities in this uh, seminar, which uh, I look forward to uh, encouraging colleagues, other colleagues of mine to participate in and maybe doing it again in the future. I think just going back on the first premise, I don't see the role of DPI and public information as image building because I think we see it much more than that. It's not just about creating and working on the image of the United Nations. Last year, we had a town hall meeting for the entire department when I joined with two new directors, uh, Stephen De Jarik and uh, Deborah Seward, under the leadership of uh, then Under Secretary General Kiyo Akasaka, and we reformulated the mission statement of the department. And I think I would like to use that as a beginning to see where and how we see our role uh, moving forward. The Department of Public Information is dedicated to communicating the ideals and work of the United Nations to the world, to interacting and partnering with diverse audiences, and to building support for peace, development, and human rights for all. Inform, engage, act. These are the three uh, final action-oriented uh, points that we, we included in the mission statement. The bulk of the staff that are working in the department, yes, it is 700, but you know that in, in the departments, uh, Ambassador Kamal, you've worked in the UN, you know how uh, the, not all of those are public information people. Some of them are support staff. Uh, some of them uh, are providing technical uh, assistance, like the people who are providing this video conference and supporting it behind are uh, probably uh, public information and department staff. Many of the staff in the field, uh, we have 63 UN information centers, and actually, when the United Nations was created, the first field presence of the United Nations was public information, UN information centers. 60 plus years ago, there was no internet. Not only was there no internet, uh, electricity and, and television were not in many parts of the world. So for the UN to be able to actually communicate and to have uh, its information material available in different parts of the world had to be physically present in those countries. And I think that's, that's what the UN Information Center has tried to do, to be present, to uh, set up, in, in many cases, uh, provide uh, library, uh, the, uh, support depository libraries, plus also uh, working with the member states in that governments to uh, observe the major observances. But what we have moved forward is that the role of public information is not just about information, but also about partnership and creating partnerships to uh, allow and, and enable opportunities for people in those countries to know what is being decided in the United Nations. Many times, Member states come to the UN, they agree on a, on a resolution, they pass a resolution, and then we have, of course, the biggest example, the Millennium Development, the Millennium Declaration, and then, then the Millennium Development Goals. So for, for us, we saw the role for public information is actually to communicate these roles. It's the same way that the human rights, and you talk about if people don't know their rights, they will not ask for them. So there's member states, leaders agreed on the Millennium Development Goals, let the whole world know what they agreed on, and we try to create partnerships that would enable the public at large to know what their own governments agreed to, so that they, again, can also put pressure to create commitments to make the achievement of the MDGs possible. That's just one small example of what, what we see the role of information. In terms of the image, the UN's image it varies from one country to another, from even one period to another, and sometimes for different reasons. If you look at the current now, at the moment, 
you will see some articles in, in some uh, media that may see that uh, Agenda 21 or 1992 Rio Earth Summit and preparations for Rio Plus 20 as a conspiracy and an attempt to have a create world government to put restrictions on, on, on national governments and they, these media sources ideologically prefer a small government so let alone their position for a world government. It's misinformation of course that needs to be corrected. Uh, the climate change, the need for us to work to create sustainable development are scientifically proven. Uh, the I was two days in a in an event two days ago. I was in an event where a representative of World Wildlife Fund was was making a presentation in which he spoke about the current population of, of the planet, seven billion people, is actually currently uh, consuming at the at the rate they are consuming is about one and a half Earths in terms of the resources that we're looking at. So it's these kind of things that we don't necessarily work in isolation. We try to identify partnerships within the NGO community, within the academic community, uh, within even the creative community to communicate those messages to the wider public. The UN is mainly, of course, about peace and security, uh, de uh, development and human rights. So we try to bring all of that together. The resources that we have, um, the 700 plus staff, in, in the UN headquarters, I mean, we provide the information services for conferences. So when people see the webcast of a General Assembly debate or the Security Council session, that is being organized by the United Nations. We have a UN television, we have UN radio uh, in the six official languages, plus Swahili, uh, plus Portuguese. And, and those are programs that are carried over by hundreds of radio stations around the world. In a way, if you want to paraphrase it, the Department of Public Information is working with the traditional media, uh, the established media in terms of written media, press releases, uh, website now, internet, uh, radio and television, meetings coverage, but also we recently established social media presence. Uh, we have a social media team that works to promote and spread the information about the ideals and work of the United Nations through Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and other uh, Weibo for in the Chinese uh, and, and so on. Uh, in addition, and this is where I come to the outreach division, if you, uh, if you want me to move in, in the outreach, we uh, believe in the power of partnerships. I think the staff of the United Nations, in total, the UN Secretariat employs 44,000 people, and that includes the civilian staff in 18 peacekeeping missions. The entire UN system employs another 31,000 people, so that's 75,000 uh, people. McDonald's employs 1.7 million people. The budget, the annual budget of the United Nations Secretariat is about 3.6 million dollars. Actually, 2.6 million dollars, I'm sorry. Uh, and we have 7.1 million dollars for peacekeeping operations every year. The other UN system organizations, if you add their budget, that's 9.7 billion dollars. The city of New York budget is $63.4 billion. The Gates, Melinda and Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation annually spends $3.4 billion. And you're talking about an organization which is recognized as the world's leading multilateral organization that is tasked with securing peace and security, uh, stability around the world, development and guiding the process of development and the preserve and protection and promotion of human rights. So I think you have rightly touched it. We have really limited resources and that's why with the power of partnership, I think we can amplify the little that we have. When we partner with NGOs and we have the NGO annual NGO power conference, uh, we have about 1500 people participate. It's not only a forum for a discussion, but also it becomes an area for networking. They get together. Uh, lessons are learned and also they carry the baton and they take take on the work of informing and advocating for the issues that we try to advocate through our own uh, channels. And that's just an example of some of the things that we're doing. Uh, let me pick up on uh, two points that you've made. The first is about the ideals of the UN. There, there's no doubt that these ideals are unquestioning and unquestionable. 
The problem is not about the ideals of the UN, but about the actual performance of the UN. Because that performance is in peace and security and in uh, economic development. And by and large, that performance has been not up to the expectations of the world. In peace and security, you have three major zones of tension. The Middle East, the uh, South Asia, the Far East. The United Nations has either been absent or unsuccessful in each of these three areas. In economic development, uh, there is a gap which is growing between the rich and the poor and inside countries between the super rich and the poor. And so the UN concept, which is of welfare and of an ability to sit and discuss and create a better uh, and happier world full of milk and honey, that is not quite being achieved. And so now you have your second point. You say, because that ideal is important, therefore we have to have partnerships. And I agree that 700 people working for a pittance, you're not going to be able to change the world. But you have in front of you a captive audience of NGOs and students. You have seven, six or seven universities sitting in front of you. Each one of them is willing to contribute in the work of the ideals of the United Nations. How are you putting concrete content into your outreach, into the universities sitting in front of you? And they are sitting in front of you because they are committed to your ideals. And they are committed to helping you in your partnership uh, uh, actions. Thank you for that opportunity, and I'd like to thank, thank them for their interest and support. I mean, the role that we do is, of course, is to provide that information. I mean, this is, this is part of how we uh, add to the uh, efforts of other NGOs and other people who are committed to these issues. The information that member states agree, on, and the UN is the largest normative setting organization, and this is where uh, the value added is that it is recognized as being legitimate. So when, when, when in a conflict situation or in, in, in issues of development, peace and security and human rights, member states, however strong and powerful they may be, uh, they are always, and their views are seen, if they come to interfere or to mediate, there's always seen to be a hidden agenda. But when the UN comes, and I think the UN is not always uh, perfect or always successful, I agree with that, and there, there have been failures. And, and I think if one looks just at the, an event that we uh, observed last week in, in the UN, which is the commemoration of the Rwandan genocide, 1994, uh, in, in Rwanda, that was a big failure for UN uh, presence where those uh, atrocities allow, uh, took place over 100 days and more, almost a million people were, were killed. But however, the, the process of, of learning and improving, I think one has to also recognize it. There was the Brahimi report later on, and then the review of peacekeeping and the need to have robust mandates that member states should also support the peacekeeping operations when they authorize them, uh, and that, that the responsibility to protect was later adopted uh, in 2005. So there are changes that are uh, basically developments as the work goes on. If we look back and, and look at the UN contribution, uh, yes, true, there are areas that the conflicts are still not necessarily resolved, not, not flaring, but the UN's presence in terms of peacekeeping has allowed a sort of level of stability and in terms of mediation. And we look at, and I mentioned there are now 18 or 16 peacekeeping missions that are active today in the UN. Historically, from the start of peacekeeping, uh, which is 60, Three years ago, there were more than 60 uh, peacekeeping missions. Those peacekeeping missions were wound down and, and closed down and, and successfully concluded. Uh, some of those areas, uh, the conflict erupted. And again, when we look at that and why did conflict erupt, actually 50% of conflicts uh, restart again after five years of, of their conclusion because the basis for proper settlement were not laid down. And this is why. There's a new office in the UN that again was set up uh, maybe uh, six or seven years ago, peace building support, uh, the Office of Peace Building Support that works with countries coming out of conflict with the UN country team to try to ensure that peace was built on, on solid basis. So here and there I think there are successes, 
there are situations which have been proven to be more difficult and complex than traditionally envisaged. And let's, let's also uh, recognize that when member states and the Security Council are united and support the action uh, that is agreed on, then progress is achieved. When the Security Council and member states are not always in agreement or divided, then it is difficult for UN to act on its own. So this is the also part of the reality of this organization, which is composed of 193 member states. So in terms of complexity of the discussions and different agendas, different arguments, uh, if, if one takes that level of complexity and the level of different uh, influences, I would think that the success rate is, 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 is very good. And, uh, it doesn't mean that we are satisfied. I think we always want to do better and to move the world to a much more stable, peaceful uh, situation. Because without peace and security, development cannot take place. Without development, and peace and security become untenable always. You need to have both working together. And the third pillar is, of course, human rights. I think the three pillars that we try to work as reinforcing is very important from our perspective. Uh, yes, but uh, you no. recognize that the United Nations, despite what it calls itself, is not really an organization. It's a table with 193 chairs around it, and its job is to discuss and to arrive at consensus or, or not arrive at consensus. But the problem is that it is not one table of 193. It is two tables. There's one table with only five chairs. And that table is eating salmon, smoked salmon and caviar all the time. And then there's another table of 188, which is eating just bones and scraps and hot dogs. And so the inequality, which leads to a totally non-democratic system, is a fundamental weakness in the United Nations, because it leads then to selectivity of what are the mandates and what gets done and what gets ignored. And so you are working, firstly, without adequate financial resources. And number two, you are working in an atmosphere of selectivity in where you can act and where you cannot act. And these are very strong limitations. And how do you get over these limitations of trying to put your finger on the political will which is going to determine the actions of the United Nations, which are going to define your mandate, because your mandate is outreach. But outreach depends on what is the political will behind it. In terms of the largest part of the mandate comes from the General Assembly. And the General Assembly is, and I think you will agree with me, where every member state has the same vote, whether it's a, a small island state with 10,000 people in total population or a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, country with one billion plus or the largest uh, economy in the world, the US, same vote, one vote, one country. And the largest number of group, the G77 plus China, has an automatic majority in the General Assembly. So in, in a way one can look at in the General Assembly, the, the power that is not lopsided in the Security Council, it is balanced in the General Assembly. It's two different, different bodies with two different mandates, but they are reinforcing. And I think even member states, who are the masters of this organization, this is an organization of governments of member states, recognize that, and there is a committee uh, that meets annually within the General Assembly that is called the Security Council of Reform. So I think that is a process that is taking place, but it's not uh, for us as Secretariat to uh, interfere in this. This is a, as a, we recognize our limitation as Secretariat in an organization where the the founders, the one who pay the bills, are the member states. But when necessary, and I think this is the point where the Secretary General has uh, a power which is called the pulley pulpit, and he has used it and uses it very often, uh, which it, he pronounces himself on, on issues uh, whether or not the Security Council or the General Assembly have spoken, but I think he, he supports that role. In, in general, I think the UN, when it was established, yes, it was basically as a forum, as a table that member states come and talk. Let's, let's look at how much the UN has changed. 
the UN was created with 51 member states. Today it has 193 member states. And where did these member states come from? The majority of them came from countries that were colonized, that became independent and in developing countries. And there, there, that is one big change. The peacekeeping notion, the, there is no word in the charter, there's actually no mention of peacekeeping. It was introduced in 1949, um, and then later on by unarmed observers, but then full peacekeeping force. The UN eventually, at some point, was and is, I mean, was running uh, the transition in, in East Timor, Timor-Leste, in Kosovo. The UN is almost running the affairs of a country. Uh, the UN is, is the uh, active uh, promoter of human rights and the, 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 these issues, the change of the Human Rights Council from the Human Rights Committee. So we should look at those, what I would call evolution. Uh, as the world changes, the UN has changed. Maybe the pace is not as fast as we would like it to be, but I think we have to recognize that there is change. The other thing that I wanted to add is that the role of governments in many countries is also changing and the role of civil society has increased. There are many multinational companies that are actually much more powerful economically than a lot of the majority of member states in the United Nations. Also, in democracies, the role of civil society is very important. The role of civil society, whether it's academia, whether it's in non-governmental organizations, whether it's young groups, youth groups, women groups, who are active and who are advocates for issues can influence political uh, opinions and political positions in their own governments and I think this is something that we have to recognize that I know that some academics refer to the third United Nations the first being the member states the second being the secretariat and the third is the civil society and the third uh, the fourth element is of course the private sector as I look at the preparations for Rio plus 20 which is now we are looking and we're looking at as the major conference on sustainability coming up in June we are not looking at it as an end. We see Rio plus 20 as the beginning of a process where the world needs to wake up. Sustainability and sustainable issues are reaching, I think, a critical point. The future we want is the name of the campaign that we are leading with as Department of Public Information for Rio plus 20. It's not about what has been decided by member states. It's about you, young people, uh, attending this seminar, but also your colleagues. What is the future that you want? Do you want your children to have the same and enjoy the same issues and the same water quality and quantity that we are enjoying today, the same air, uh, the same resources? Or are we going to burn down at the rate that we're going? Uh, we will not have resources left for the future generations, and that affects everything. Uh, Rio is looking at oceans, it's looking at water, it's looking at cities, it's looking at employment, it's looking at energy, uh, poverty, and disaster risk reduction. So all of these different issues affect every single one of us today, but also affects the future generations. And I think what we want to put the information and, and sources of information to the young people, I cannot tell somebody what they should do, I think they know better what in their own community and in their own university they can do to actually push this agenda forward. Yes, but the problem is that you are reaching out to young people, and rightly so, because they are undoubtedly the majority uh, of numbers and brain power in the world. The problem is how to incorporate them into the decision making of the United Nations because they have no entry into the UN. These NGOs are allowed only to enter into two anti rooms of the United Nations. One anti room is called DPI, and the other anti room is called ECOSOC. But they cannot get into the General Assembly, and they certainly cannot get into the Security Council. And so, the key decision-making bodies, which is Security Council first and General Assembly second, these NGOs and these young people have no entry. And so what are you doing? I understand your outreach, but I want to know what is your in-reach to bring these people into your decision-making system. By going further, I don't think that we should only look at the General Assembly and the Security Council. There are also UN conferences, and the UN conferences, the NGOs participate, 
and they advocate, and they also have the right to speak and to present papers. The NGO DPI conference that was held in Bonn uh, in September of last year uh, witnessed the participation of 1,300 people from 350 NGOs and came up with a declaration, and that declaration was focusing on sustainability, building up towards Rio, but also in the volunteerism, the International Year of Volunteers. And that declaration was shared by us within the UN, with the Secretary General of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, but also by the government of Germany uh, as the host of the country to the uh, other members of the General Assembly, to all the membership, through the President. And just today, that declaration was actually issued uh, as an official document in the six official languages. And as far as I know, the elements that were built up by the civil society have been incorporated into the zero draft and they have they are playing a role in that process but i don't look at the member states participating in the general assembly and the security council only at that point of entry and i think the ngos the civil society has the role already to go back home you know these ambassadors are representing governments and those governments for the majority part i think we live now in a, in a world where the majority of the governments are democratically elected. And I think they, that is there where the role of the civil society, the private sector comes to play in their own governments, in their own communities, in their own societies. When we want to talk about changing patterns of behavior in terms of consumption, if we continue consuming in the same way that economy is relying on consumption, we will probably eat the planet away. But we have to start at the very beginning uh, in, in, in different fora, in the schools, at the universities, and that's where it starts. And I think when we start also, these educated young people who are aware and more aware and concerned for their future, they will want to communicate that message to their politicians and representatives, and that's where it starts. It doesn't start only in the General Assembly and the Security Council. Okay, let's take questions from our partner. Uh, universities. We'll take two questions from each university. The two questions will come together and will be answered together. We'll start with Bronx, followed by Lehigh. Over to Bronx for two questions. Hello. Um, Alejandro Prieto from Community College. Well, I have a question. Um, what is the United Nations initiative towards the anti-Islamic rhetoric worldwide? Okay, second question. which you can answer. Sure. The first one on anti-Islam. Islam is one third of the population of the world. And as in any community, there are uh, extremists who can be on the right or on the left. But you cannot judge the vast middle from the fringes on the right or the left. Mm -hmm. And we don't judge Christianity by picking up Hitler and saying, well, this is what Christianity did. Why is it that Islam is being constantly looked at on the basis of the extremist fringe rather than the vast middle? Question one. Question two on Syria. You spoke about peacekeeping. And you said peacekeeping is a very important function. Now, in peacekeeping, on the case of Syria, a monitoring mission has been set up in two days, literally in two days. Whereas in other places, it takes months before any deployment takes place. And in the case of Rwanda, to which you referred, the deployment literally never took place, hence the, the, the genocide. And so why is it that Syria is so important 
as compared to other places which I don't want to name, but which are in your mind and mine. Okay. And so wh why is Syria so important? Back to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, just go back to the first question. Uh, in terms of, I think, the UN is, is, is as disturbed, and I think in terms of the anti-Islamic or Islamophobia, let's call it that, what, what, what has been used, the term has been used. The, under the leadership of the UN, an Alliance of Civilizations initiative that was originally proposed by the uh, Iranian president in Turkey and uh, Spanish prime minister was created and continues to organize uh, a campaign, seminars, activities. It is still an active element of the work that we are doing around the world to bring in uh, scholars to bring politicians, youth leaders, organizations to talk about the alliance of civilizations rather than the uh, conflict between civilizations. We disagree that there is a conflict between civilizations. And I think that's, that's an important part. And I would ask you to go and, and visit the website of the Alliance of Civilizations. You will find actually there links to many of the initiatives that are being planned and organized that also you can participate in to see what is being done by the Secretariat of the Alliance of Civilizations to address the issue of Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or any other kind of uh, prejudice against a group of people or a larger uh, religion. The other element that the Department of Public Information actually for a number of years, beginning in 2003, uh, started organizing a series of uh, seminars that we called Unlearning Intolerance and one of which was a major conference that was organized here at the UN headquarters to address the issue of Islamophobia. And this is something that I, I think we need to work and we do work and UNESCO is also working actively with member states to address the core basis of that so that at the young age uh, people uh, learn to appreciate diversity and respect people for who you are. They're, you shouldn't judge them by what you want them to be or what you think they are. In terms of Syria, I think to talk about the uh, peacekeeping missions and monitors, the initially, it isn't in two days, uh, Ambassador Kamal. Let's not forget these, the crisis in Syria has existed for over 13 months. Uh, according to UN estimates, more than 10,000 uh, Syrians, uh, civilians and military have been killed in this crisis and the UN has been uh, trying to work together with the regional organization that is available, uh, that is there, the League of Arab States. Originally, the main effort was actually by the League of Arab States. They sent Arab, uh, the monitors. That mission did not work. It failed. The conflict continued within Syria. And then the League of Arab States and the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, jointly with the uh, Secretary General of the Arab League, appointed the Joint Special Envoy, former Secretary General Kofi Annan, with two deputies and a small team, and they started working tirelessly with the Syrian government, with the opposition, with neighboring countries, interested states. That resulted in what became known as the Anan 6.4, uh, a way forward uh, that the Syrian government agreed to. They were endorsed by the Security Council, and today there was a closed session of the Security Council. Because it's a closed session, I, I, I uh, haven't attended it, but uh, I think uh, that the, the, it will come out. They received a report from the Special Envoy, and I think media will, will, will communicate the outcome of that recommendation. It is expected that the Security Council will support the proposal for a larger uh, monitoring mission. So far, only six people have arrived in Syria and they were going to be followed and the number was going to go to 30 until it is endorsed by the Security Council. So, I mean, I was watching the news on CNN just two days ago and they were, they were showing images of the violence that is continuing in Syria and they were saying, and this is after the UN monitors have arrived and under the eyes of the UN monitors. It was only six people that the first technical mission was there and yet expectations were high this is a conflict that has been going on for 13 months, and I think we have to recognize that it will take a while for the uh, cessation of hostilities or ceasefire to take place. And I think let's give the mediator, the special envoy, the opportunity to work with parties. Let's give the uh, monitors the opportunity to uh, spread and be present. And then let's, let's hope 
uh, that the conflict will come to an end and that the way forward is through uh, dialogue between the government and other parties to come up to a situation where uh, the Syrian people's aspirations are fulfilled for peace, security and development. Let's take two questions from Lehigh, followed by two questions from Mercy. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Nasser. My name is Savannah Boylan, and I'm studying international relations. My question is, talking about the Rio summit and environmental problems, there seems to be a tragedy of the common issue, especially among the economic powerhouses of our world. How do you feel the UN can act to change this problem that seems so eminent to our future world? Uh, could you uh, clarify, when you say common issue, you are talking of global commons. Is that the question? Uh, tragedy of the commons issue? Define that a little bit better. Um, define more as um, um, states not willing to uh, make sacrifices for a future world in hopes that others will. I see. Well, mm -hmm. we, we normally refer to it as the global commons. That is to say those issues which are of common interest to the whole world, such as oceans, uh, atmosphere, outer space. Antarctica, etc. Second question from Lehigh. Yeah, good afternoon, Ambassador Kamal and Mr. Nasser. My name is Marina and I'm studying in the College of Education. And at the same time, I'm a Lehigh Youth Representative to the United Nations. Uh, so what suggestions do you have for me and my colleagues uh, in order to make our experiences in the United Nations the most effective, successful and useful, not only for our personal development, but also in terms of bringing a change to our society? Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think the preparations for Rio Plus 20 are, uh, just to give you an example, they started with a zero draft uh, that was uh, 17 pages. And two weeks, a week ago, the zero draft, based on the input, the comments of different member states, different groups, and there's something called major groups, and that represents the NGOs, the private sector, and others. Uh, the zero draft grew to 200 pages and just this morning I saw a reference to the fact that the following input that was received last week, the zero draft has grown to 268 pages and that is something that uh, will need to go down between now and Rio to something manageable in the range of what the zero draft was and maybe even uh, smaller. Uh, a year ago, I think when we were looking at Rio, the way ahead in Rio, we didn't see the level of civil society engagement interest in Rio as we do today, and I think that is very important. The, a year ago, the level of participation from different governments was not very clear, and there was even some, uh, the main priority was seen how can we get prime ministers, presidents, heads of government and state to come and attend Rio. Uh, the latest uh, list of prescribed speakers that I was uh, briefed about was that so far we have 128 heads of government and state committed to uh, in the list of uh, speakers, so I most likely would be attending uh, at Rio. And that, compared to 1992, uh, there were 107, so that is actually a, a very positive sign. I think we, the world and the uh, UN, it's also aware of what happened a few years ago in terms of raised expectations and having the presentation of, of Copenhagen as an end in itself, we don't want to, the campaign was let's, Copenhagen should be the time when we seal the deal on a, a new deal for climate change. And when that deal wasn't sealed in Copenhagen, even though progress was achieved, it was deemed and seen as a failure and then expectations were really uh, unmet. Uh, and of course in the follow-up, summits in Cancun and in, in, uh, in South Africa, much more progress was achieved in actually meeting the, the what was aimed to be done in Copenhagen. But then that becomes too late and it's uh, almost uh, not seen as remedying the damage that was made by raising the expectations for Copenhagen. And that's why when I said earlier, we're looking at Rio as the beginning of a process. And it's, when it's Rio plus 20, it's not meant to be plus 20 from 1992. We are talking about plus 20 in the future. That is the future we want. What is what is needed for us? And there are certain areas where there is actually almost uh, agreement. 
uh, the green economy is one of the things that are coming up when we look at the green economy in terms of, but in terms of also in the context of poverty eradication, uh, creating jobs that are sustainable and creating jobs that are in, in, in areas that are sustainable, the environment sustainability is maintained, investments in, in energy, uh, energy is the key element, is seen as one of the uh, pillars of progress and the Secretary General has launched a campaign, uh, the energy uh, campaign where we're, we're looking at addressing the needs for energy poverty. If you look at the energy inequality in the world, a lot of the people in the world uh, do not have access to electricity or to clean uh, energy sources. They rely mainly on, on, on burning solid fuel. Uh, the energy efficiency in developed countries, there's a lot of energy that is actually wasted and needs to be saved. And then investments in renewable energy. So this is, this is one small area and I think it goes beyond just governments. It is the level of consumers, the levels of the private sector, and I think investments in the future. So we are looking at all of that. These are some of the issues that are there. In terms of governments and government positions, and I think this is where your role comes in. Uh, sometimes a vocal minority that may have an ideological uh, perspective of things that is alien to what common sense and science dictate, uh, dominates. And if politicians are only hearing from people who are skeptics about climate change, uh, then that's what they are going to vote on in, in Congress or in, in, in the Parliament or, or in uh, other uh, fora. So I think the role of that we are trying to make the information available to you, but it's up to you also to put the pressure on, on your government to push them in the right direction so that they know that you care about the future, you care about sustainability, you care about the climate change. Uh, there are 50,000 people that are going to be in Rio. The greatest numbers are not coming from governments, they are coming from civil society, from the private sector, from universities, from youth groups, from NGOs. So there are many areas that you can work with uh, to push the process forward. And I think many of the governments, as Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, many times said, leaders should see themselves as leaders of the world and look at the long-term interests of their citizens as part of the population of this planet, not as leaders of a government that will be elected or unelected in a year or two. And I think that's, that's very important. As youth representatives in the United Nations, I think you have opportunities that are not available to a majority of youth in the world, other than uh, the participation. I think we are ourselves looking for ideas from you. How can we uh, benefit more from your participation what can uh, you suggest to us in creating formats where your participation and in input is of more value? And I think uh, we welcome those suggestions. We don't want to, we don't have any solutions uh, or a magic solution. We, we actually think that you know more of what you need and what you would like, and we are willing to listen and help you achieve that. Yes, I just want to point out that uh, Lehigh, uh, is extremely active yes. in its contacts with the United Nations, thanks to Professor Hunter, who's sitting quietly at the end of that table, and uh, as is Fairleigh Dickinson. But on your point regarding Rio, if you say that Rio is not is the beginning of a process for the future, then it should not have been called Rio Plus 20. Because Rio plus 20 gives me the impression that you are 20 years old and you still haven't started waking up. And that is what happened in 1997, that Rio plus 5 became Rio minus 5. And so I have a feeling that you may run into the danger of Rio plus 20 being Rio minus 20. Because any document which is more than five pages long is beyond absorptive capacity and therefore not acceptable. And so if you have a 250-page document, it's going to go nowhere. It's going to be full of platitudes. We don't want platitudes. We want action. And, I think and action means agreement on things like uh, climate change, agreement on other things. These are vital agreements, but you're not. Are you going to get them? 
or are you just going to say we need agreements? No, I think I mean they're working on different levels. It's not just, of course, I mentioned one example of the green, uh, the green economy, green energy. But I think there's also discussion on the institutional framework. There are discussions and in, in the way forward in terms of the. Uh, Commission on Sustainable Development, whether that's actually going to be maintained or, or replaced with a Sustainability Council, the future of the, uh, whether there will be a, the UN Environment Program, whether it's going to grow into something else, a specialized agency type. So these are different other things that are being discussed. There is a multitude of issues that are being discussed and on the table in Rio. And I think the level of engagement and enthusiasm that we are now seeing uh, is 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 a reason for optimism, as far as I, 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 can, I can tell. Uh, and, and I think we are always emphasizing the Rio Plus 20 is about the next 20 years. It's not about the past 20 years. And that's why we are saying we want to position it as looking for the future. And that's why we came with the, with the, logo, with the logo, the future we want, not, not, not any other logo. We're looking towards the future and to work on all of these issues. And there will be large representation from the private sector. Let's not forget. Most energy that is being produced in the world is produced by private sector companies. Many of those companies are the ones that need to address their own uh, practices in terms of purchases, in terms of investment, to become more sustainable. And I think the consumers, the activists, the advocates, the civil society, we all have a role to play in pressuring them and holding them accountable, as we do hold governments accountable. Over to uh, Mercy for two questions, followed by Towson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you had mentioned previously the responsibility to protect as evidence of lessons learned from Rwanda and Darfur and the Balkans. Uh, but given the failure of interest in Bahrain, the failure to act in Syria, and the destabilization of Mali as a direct result of the implication or the application of responsibility to protect in Libya, can we really call that progress? Thank you. Second question. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Grace Valuya. I was fortunate enough to represent Mercy College um, this past April in the National Model United Nations as part of the Rio 92 Committee. Um, I would like to inform you that during the Mediterranean countries and European Union meeting in Paris held just this past February, Atkin Steiner, the executive director of UNEP, said, the time has come for us to rethink how we manage our world's oceans. My question is, Is what is your stand on sustaining a blue economy and how can the UN and its partner organizations can fully facilitate the protection of our marine systems? Thank you. All yours. Thanks. I think in an organization where uh, the principle of establishing the organization in 1945 was uh, the uh, sovereignty of member states and the non-interference in the affairs of the member states. To have the General Assembly and the organization, eventually membership, endorse the new concept of the responsibility to protect is a major progress. And I think the key uh, is, of course, how it is then applied. And this is where the first element of what Ambassador Kamal spoke about in the beginning is that the ultimate body in the United Nations that is charged and mandated with the issues of peace and security is the Security Council. And the Security Council, at its current state today is representative of maybe the world of 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and, and I think members themselves are looking at that issue and, and, and discussing it among themselves. Uh, when the resolution on using the responsibility to protect was used to authorize the NATO intervention to protect civilians in Libya, that was a major important uh, development. And I think it helped the Libyan people eventually uh, get rid of uh, Gaddafi. The implications of that and what has happened in, in Mali uh, is, of course, something that is unfortunate. And that is now something that the UN is working with ECOWAS, the regional African uh, organization, with the current government. And remember, when the uh, coup, military coup, took place, there was work. And now they have appointed a new government. And we're working with them to address the uh, root causes of the spillover that happened in Mali. In terms of the other two uh, conflicts, I mean, the UN Secretary General has been and, and vocally uh, active, uh, very uh, spoke very often about the need 
for all governments. And it started when the events started in Tunis, it started in Egypt, in Libya, in, in Bahrain, in, in Syria, to speak about the need for governments, all governments, to listen to the aspirations of their people and to respect those aspirations and to work, to work towards uh, finding solutions and giving the people the right to uh, have a say in their own future. And I think if you look at the changes that have affected the Middle East region, they're Im immense. And we shouldn't judge the outcome by what is happening now. The change takes time. <coughs> the process is not going to be easy. Building democracy <coughs> and new traditions is something that is a major investment and there will always be setbacks and problems and not all parties will agree that this is a positive outcome. But we have to always try to make it positive by working with those who believe in inclusiveness, in, inclu in, in, in the need to make sure that the, uh, the basic principle is the respect for the dignity and the human rights of all members of that society. And I think that's what we try to work with. When it comes to the Security Council and the General Assembly, of course, these are issues that the member states themselves need to discuss and agree on. And once they do, we as Secretary, we will work with them to implement those, those decisions. The model you, 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 you mentioned, the model UN, is something that I haven't mentioned, is that something that we do work with as part of the outreach division. We actually organized three global model United Nations uh, in, in the past three years. And we are now moving forward to a new model. Instead of us organizing another, yet another model UN where there are 400 model UNs around the world, we want to work with dozens of, of model UNs by providing the technical expertise and experience that we have about how the UN actually works to all of these global model UNs around the world and linking them with the proper tools for how to organize it the way the UN works. Model UNs, the way they are working now, they use the parliamentary procedure, which is actually not the way the UN works with. So just a small example on, on model UNs. And I think it's a great way for young people to get involved and to see how uh, once you're in a multilateral environment, the compromises and the issues that you need to work with and how the UN eventually, what we arrive at, is always a compromise because you need to find the common ground between different competing interested states. So that's, that could maybe answer the, the earlier part of why doesn't the Security Council or General Assembly always agree on something because what they agree on is eventually the common ground between different competing or interested groups and governments. In terms of oceans, oceans is one of the key issues in Rio, and I think the future of oceans, the future of marine life, is uh, very high on the agenda. Uh, I think UN Environment Program is one of the key UN organizations working on this, and I think the fact that oceans is one of the seven key issues in Rio is a sign that that is one of the top priority issues. It's not just about the, the future uh, marine life. When we look at the fisheries, uh, disappearing fish stock, uh, it is, it's a major issue of concern for, for uh, anybody who's concerned about the future. Yes, but you recognize, Mr. Nasser, that uh, we have a major problem with the permanent members of the Security Council, both on responsibility to protect and on oceans. On responsibility to protect, the Security Council permanent membership feels that they must have the right to selectively choose where to have exercise responsibility to protect and where not to exercise responsibility to protect. And the result is that depending on who is a friend of whom in the permanent membership of the Security Council, if you are an ally, responsibility to protect is not going to be used. And that is why the case of Bahrain has come up and been referred to in a question. On oceans, it is identical because one permanent member of the Security Council, whom we shall not name out of politeness to the soil on which we stand, has not signed the law of the sea. And if it has not signed the law of the sea, they don't believe in it. And so you can go to Rio and you can talk to your heart's content and write 200 or 2,600 pages. You will still not be able to move until you can get the permanent members to budge from their position of total, uh, absolute monarchy. I think 
I, as, a, as an individual or even a UN secretary, will not be able to influence the position of a member state. But you, as students and different nationalities, you have the capacity to try to influence your own governments. And I think that is where the individual responsibility comes into play. Yes, the uh, Secretary General uh, has, and I said he, he does use his position as Secretary General, and he uses the pulley puppet, and he has made statements even when the Security Council didn't or uh, couldn't come up to a, a unified presidential statement. So this is the reality that we work with. And I think we have to recognize this reality and try to get the best out of what we can from what we have. I mean, we are not going to be able to change the structure of the Security Council. Instead of engaging in that debate, let's see what we can do with the existing Security Council. How much can we push it to the uh, as much close as possible to what an ideal situation would be and individually it is a responsibility of citizens in every country to themselves put their own governments to task for what they want them to do uh, let's take two questions from Towson followed by two questions from Vancouver uh, good afternoon, Ambassador Kamal and uh, Mr. Nasser. Thank you very much for a lively discussion. I'll turn, uh, I'll turn things over to two of our students here who have questions for you. Good morning, Ambassadors. Thank you for being with us today. Um, I understand that there's a number of non-governmental organizations and private sector parties that you work with, um, but I'd like to ask if you could name more specifically organizations that you feel are making transformative change um, in terms of economic development and more specifically grassroots organizations that you feel are effectively addressing economic development and what kind of methodologies are they using um, that you believe that they are more successful of um, actually forthcoming the purpose of the UN. Second question. My name is Sandrine, and um, you previously talked about the various different UN teams that are established to um, address several issues, such as um, the stereotype of uh, the Islamic religion or the, pro or the promotion of peace. And I think it's very important for these UN teams to have a third level of understanding concerning the issues that they are created to address. So my question for you is what criteria are used to select members for these teams to ensure that they are well versed in such issues so as to um, effectively determine solutions? Very good questions. Congratulations to Towson for excellent questions. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. I think sometimes the most effective NGO in an area uh, or in a country might not be the biggest or West funded. And there are examples of really small NGOs in, in developing countries that have made really concrete effect on people's lives in their own communities, uh, whether it's even just by arranging for clean water to be uh, available or uh, to arrange an immunization campaign or to building a small hospital that would help uh, women give uh, safe delivery. So it's not easy to name one or two, one or two NGOs because it's, it's, there are thousands of NGOs. There are 1,300 NGOs that are associated with the Department of Public Information, about four to 5,000 NGOs that are associated with the Economic and Social Council. And all of these NGOs are just a drop in the bucket in the world of civil society. I mentioned earlier that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation every year spends about three and a half billion dollars uh, and most of it in public health and education and their impact once described by uh, a columnist in the New York Times exceeds that of, of WHO in terms of public health in Africa uh, in terms of the projects that they have supported I mean I don't I mean that's that's uh, that's what I read but it, I, I cannot really verify that but if you look at it you will find some non-governmental organizations, some groups that, that in your area, in your region, that you feel that have a message, a mission that with which you agree, then you can join them or work with them. And I think you need to be comfortable with the NGO that you work with. Uh, don't go behind the slogan or just the, if your passion is, is, is with wildlife and the environment, then go to the World Wildlife Fund uh, or, or some other NGOs. Uh, the, uh, I, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, or, or the uh, if you're a doctor, medicine. I mean, there are many, many NGOs that are really 
uh, out there that are very active, effective, and I think I would do a disservice to uh, the greater number that I don't know uh, by mentioning the few that I do know. So you have to do some research in your own area, in your own, in your own region, and, and, and actually find the ones that you think are closest to you. In terms of the stereotype, the Alliance of Civilizations is there's a, it's a project within the executive office of the Secretary General. The number of people working in it is a handful of people, and they are selected according to the criteria that we recruit with. I mean, every position in the United Nations is, uh, is verified according to what are the requirements in terms of education, in terms of uh, qualifications, experience, and then that is uh, announced the candidates are applying and then selected in accordance with those uh, competitive requirements. In terms of who they work with, that's of course, they are now, they have been in existence for over five years. They have identified universities, university programs, youth programs, activists, some scholars, uh, NGOs that are also active in similar fields and they are working with them. They have been organizing an annual conference uh, it took place in November last year uh, in Doha with more than 3,000 participants from different parts of the world. There will be another one follow-up in Istanbul in Turkey in June. In 2010 they met in uh, Rio in uh, Brazil. So this is an annual conference and I think they have many resources and actually they have a number of experts who are not UN. I mean they are experts in different fields. Uh, on interfaith dialogue, for example, or experts on on Islamic uh, issues, or Christianity, or Judaism, or Hinduism, or other other activities. And when there is an issue that comes up, they have a mechanism that directs media that is looking for somebody to interview on a topic to these experts, so that they have somebody that can be there to address some issue that just came up uh, there. Yeah, I'd like to comment on the question of NGOs. Uh, because having chaired the meetings for four years uh, in the UN, I found that the number of NGOs which are connected with the UN is not a, f a patch on the number of NGOs which are not connected with the UN. There's a place called Nepal, up in the mountains, lost somewhere in the Himalayas. It has 80,000 registered NGOs working in Nepal out of which I don't know, two or three or four only are connected with the UN. And so we have two types of relationship here. We have a relationship between these universities in front of us and Mr. Nasser. And this is the NGO outreach between uh, the United Nations and the universities. But there is a second relationship, which is between the individual students at these universities who can reach out into any NGOs anywhere in the world. And as I said, many of them are not listed. I know that there is, for example, an NGO in Pakistan, which is operating 17 full hospitals and doing one and a half million eye surgeries every year. It's only an eye surgery uh, NGO. And giving these surgeries 100% free. 100% free, one and a half million surgeries a year. And they are not registered with the UN because they say we have no time to register ourselves. We are so busy conducting these surgeries. So there are extraordinary NGOs like that. You have an NGO in Italy called Mani Teze, which means extended hand, which is working in about 48 or 50 countries in the world, not registered with the UN. And so reach out research these yourself, and as Mr. Nasser said, define your own passion. Whatever your passion, there is an NGO that can fulfill that passion for you. Over to uh, uh, Vancouver for two questions, followed by Florham. Um, good morning, Ambassador Kamal and uh, Mr. Nasser. I was also a participant in the World uh, Model United Nations that was held about a month ago, and I couldn't help but notice that the youth seem to be losing faith in the United Nations. And as Ambas Ambassador Kamal pointed out, it's because you know the UN has been failing at a lot of um, its um, 
endeavors. So I would like to know what your department is doing to keep that faith in the United Nations, because if our generation has no faith in the United Nations, how do you expect us to come up and to rise up to be tomorrow's United Nations? Second question. Uh, this is Monal Asmari. Uh, I think um, given the complexity of the situation and the limited resources, UN is doing a good job, but the problem is that they look like they have double standard. They, I think if they at least naming names and uh, uh, give the people the information about the government that are not willing to participate and the effect of this uh, of their actions, maybe people will like um, gain the faith again. Or, and thank you. Can I take these questions first? Because I disagree with both questions from Vancouver, which is surprising because I am so fond of uh, uh, Vancouver and its students. I disagree because you are referring to the UN as if it is an external organization to you. And therefore, there is you and there is the UN. And so you think you can criticize the UN. It's not fair. You are the UN. The UN is the peoples of the world. And so the question that you have asked should really be directed back at you, both of you. I want to know what are you doing in order to create a better world? Because the UN is you and me and Mr. Nasir jointly. You cannot start by saying there is us students and then there is something called the UN which is not doing enough to make us happy. Uh, we are all one. And one way of doing this, a simple way, uh, I'm just teaching you a technique, replace the word UN by the word we, always. Instead of saying the UN is not doing X, Y, and Z, say we are not doing X, Y, and Z. And it will be closer to the truth because ultimately the people around that table of the UN is you and I and Mr. Nasir jointly. And so you cannot palm off the responsibility for the failures on others. All of us are equally responsible for the failures as well as for the successes of the United Nations system because the United States system is you and I jointly. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador Kamal. I think, first of all, I, I actually, I don't know if you remember, but I was at the World Model UN. I, I gave one of the opening speeches uh, and I spoke there about the role of youth and the Secretary General's vision for how important we think your role is as youth in contributing to the UN. Having participated in the Model UN, uh, in, in, in the activities of the Model UN, I think you will have seen uh, in the debates and in the discussions the complexity of arriving at resolutions and agreements within that intergovernmental body. And you can imagine how more difficult it is in the real situations. And I can tell you, I know, I know diplomats that they have to represent the position of their governments, and they're not necessarily always in agreement individually and personally with what that government instructions are. But their duty is to go there and say, this is the position of our government. Why is that position this way or not? I think that you can ask for every government and for every people of that government, why is that government's position hasn't changed on this issue, even though people maybe in that country have a different position. So in a way, I think participating in the model UN should give you a taste and a flavor of how things are in the UN. And if it didn't exist, we need a body like the UN to bring in member states, different groups, to talk and to agree and to set the basics for the future in terms of the normative side. If we look at, people only look and judge the UN by the number of conflicts that are taking place. Actually, statistically speaking, the number of conflicts between states has gone down dramatically. Most conflicts in the last 10, 20 years have been within states. This is a new development. There are now failed states. There are conflicts within states. There's references to non-state actors. Uh, there are talks about all of these things that, if you go back 150 years ago, 50 years ago or more, most conflicts were between states. So there has been a reduction in interstate conflict and now this is the new reality that we now are dealing with in terms of uh, conflict resolution, mediation, and trying to uh, reach 
peace and stability around the world in different parts. So let's look at the other side. The UN also, you all carry cell phones. I mean, all these cell phones work because there's a certain uh, ITU, International Telecommunication Union, or the World Postal <laughs> Union. Uh, you can you get on a plane because the World Aviation uh, uh, Organization, ICAO. ICAO, International Civil Aviation Authority, others, the WHO set standards for immunization for vaccination. Today we live in a much safer world with much more prosperity because of all of these things that have been set by United Nations bodies. In terms of addressing humanitarian issues, in terms of crises, 93 million people are provided food every day by the World Food Program around the world and addressing the basic need, one of the basic needs, which is hunger. The UNICEF and its partners around the world are responsible for the immunization and vaccination of 40% of the world's children. The number of diseases that have been put in check or even eradicated, such as smallpox, uh, polio is almost eradicated. It's all due to the effort of working together with the UN, different organizations, specialized agencies. So we should also <coughs> look at, let's not only look at some of the uh, failures or let's say incomplete uh, jobs, but let's also bear in mind the successes and be proud of that because that is the legacy of we all participating in as a citizen of today's, today's world. And remember these two young ladies, particularly the one in the hijab, you are the most powerful people in the world, individually, because with the force multipliers that you have in your hand, to which Mr. Nasser has referred the cell phones and the Twitter and the Facebooks, you are far more powerful than the 700 employees of the Department of Public Information and Ambassador Kamal, and far more powerful even than the president of the sole surviving superpower of the world. And so exercise that power. Stand up, roll up your sleeves, and do change the world. And we are with you. Over to uh, Florum for two questions, followed by Tinek. Hello, my name is Sarah Horn. I'm a graduate student. Um, Mr. Nasser, I um, would like to know, you work in so many countries, so what's the difference of the DPI work, or you call it the voice of the UN, in um, these different countries? Like, how do you operate different? And then my second question is, during the time of crisis, for example, like right now in the Middle East, how do you communicate to the people there, and how do you like actively support them in pretty much like day-to-day -day tasks? Thank you. Uh, I mean, I've worked in Gaza, Jerusalem, Cairo, Amman, Jordan, Vienna, and New York, and uh, I have been to other countries where colleagues are based on long-term basis. Of course, in each location, you are working in different roles and you're working in different languages. Uh, when I mentioned we have 63 UN information centers, they are all over the world. Most of them are in, in developing countries. We have one major center in Brussels in Europe, and they basically, you know, in the UN, our working languages are English and French. Official languages in the UN are English, French, Chinese, Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. Uh, and, but only official documents are produced in those six languages. In the Department of Public Information, we try to actually produce information material in the six official languages at headquarter level. And therefore, if you go to the UN website, you will find it in the six official languages. But in the field, we are also trying to produce them in the different languages. We, we have products in Kiswahili, we have products in Urdu, we have products in Hindi, we have products in, in Italian, in, 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 uh, in German, and so on. So that is one of the key uh, issues that we try to do at the field level by working to provide the material in the different languages. But also working in the country means that we are working, you are closer to the UN country team. The UN country team, which is actually working with the government, national, regional, local authorities, civil society, to deliver the uh, issues that, in the, especially in developing countries, the, uh, the program of development, whether it's gender issues, whether it's the children's rights and children's uh, welfare, uh, development, economic development, addressing the inequality, uh, addressing uh, human rights. So that's where we work with the UN country team, with the partnership to promote those issues at the local level. It, it, it definitely is much more effective to be able to be present 
on the ground and working with those counterparts and creating also personal relations with whether it's the government uh, officials themselves but also with the journalists with the activists to help the uh, process of sharing the information our role is information sharing but also making the information available to enable <coughs> advocacy to enable action by those who uh, then have it upon themselves the responsibility to to do that but, and, but mr nasir you spoke earlier about your presence in 53 or 63 countries i thought it was more but you are present in wide uh, swath of countries in the world you have in front of you universities with a very wide number of foreign students in them what is the relationship that can be created between these universities and their foreign students and the information centers mm -hmm. that you have abroad because i think there is a ground here for interactive marriages to be created for a better result in the ideals of the un thank you thank you for that opportunity i think let me qualify. We have 63 UN information centers. Some of them are actually composed of one staff member, and usually it's locally recruited who works in the office of the UN Development Program. So some of them have very limited resources and, and, and are tiny. Uh, and, but still, they play a role that we would like to promote. In terms of what we can do with students, foreign students at the university, we have created a new initiative in November next year. We will be celebrating two years, and I think you were at the launch event, Ambassador Kamal. The United Nations Academic Impact, which is a new uh, initiative uh, that is in the outreach division that aims to create a network of universities that are committed to 10 basic principles that are derived from the UN Charter, from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, issues of sustainability, the right to education, and so on and so forth. Now that initiative grew in less than a year to over 800 members. And some of the students in those universities took it upon themselves to come up with a new initiative that actually we didn't, we cannot claim the right to have proposed it ourselves. It was a student-led, student-created uh, initiative called ASPIRE, which is action by students to promote innovation and reform through education. It was a small group, and there are a number of them that have now sprung up in universities around the world to uh, sometimes to collect donations to send to Haiti after the earthquake, or to actually provide uh, education material to send to Mali or to, uh, to support another university in the developing countries. The, the options are limitless, the options are there, and I don't know, I know that actually some of the universities that are now with us are members of the UN Academic Impact. Some of those universities have Aspire students, Aspire groups, and I think this is a concrete example of how students at the university level can, by themselves, come up with initiatives within their own means that we can link with and uh, help them promote uh, to share experiences with other students and those uh, are available uh, linkages on our website for the UN Academic Impact. We have about three or four minutes for two questions from TNEC. Um, hello, I'm Konstantinos. Uh, hello again, um, Ambassador Kamal. Hello, Mr. Nasser. Thank you very, very for a very interesting and informative speech. Um, uh, my question is, um, how may young people join your department staff and contribute to you fulfilling your mission? And also, what job offerings do you, uh, do you give in your department? Second question. Hello, Mr. Nasser. My name is uh, Abdul Karim Al Muteri. I'm from Saudi Arabia. The question is, has the current economic crisis affected the UN's partnership with NJOS and its ability for peace uh, for uh, sorry its ability of peace of uh, keeping. So that's my question. Can you can you repeat it, please? No, repeat. We didn't quite get yeah, sure. peace. Has, where has the has the current economic crisis affected the UN's partnership with NJOS and its ability of peacekeeping? Okay. Thank you. I think working working for the United Nations is uh, is uh, open to everybody. I, I can tell you. I 
I'm a Palestine refugee. I went to schools run by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees, and I never thought that I would be working for the UN in New York. And yet, uh, after graduation, I was a local, locally hired by UNRWA in Gaza. And uh, by working to the ideals of the United Nations, working hard and delivering on, on being committed uh, to what I was doing, I was lucky enough to be recognized and then promoted in different capacities. And here I am now the acting head of a UN department uh, in New York. So without the backing in, of a state or uh, a large group. So it is possible to, to work in the UN from, from any country in the world uh, to join. There are different ways you can join. And I think maybe a, a good starting point would be to intern. If you can apply for internship to be an intern at the UN, that would actually facilitate and help you gain more insight into how the UN works. Uh, the UN has an, a program for young uh, or young professionals with two or three years of experience, and maybe a bit, a bit more. It's called the uh, YPP, the Young Professionals Program, where we have examination and registration every year to uh, diversify the employment within the UN because. Every member state has a certain uh, quota in the UN, and that quota is related to how big that country is and how big its contribution is to the United Nations. So the biggest quota is for the US, because the US covers 22% of the assessed contributions of the United Nations. Now that examination is open to countries that are under quota, and it is held towards the end of the year in different areas of specialization, economic affairs, political affairs, public information, statistics, uh, languages, uh, and so on and so forth. So you will need to go to the UN website and look at that employment, and then you see if your country is listed, and, and, and then just bear that in mind to uh, what at some point, don't wait for that. Gain experience because experience is very good. Work in the NGO sector, in the private sector, local government. But if you really want to work in the UN, the opportunities are there. And we welcome dedicated and, and talented young people. We actually want to encourage you to join the UN. In total, there are, as I said, between different peacekeeping, UN secretariat, UN system, about 70,000 jobs within the United Nations system as a whole. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket globally. So the competition is high. So, but. As I said, to look at my example, the opportunities exist. In terms of the current economic crisis, yes, it has affected everything that uh, requires voluntary contributions or donations, because many of the governments uh, have cut down in, their, in terms of what, they, what is available. Uh, by nature, of, of course, when there is an economic downturn, economic uh, crisis affects all governments that are relied on, on uh, taxation. So, uh, so far, in terms of the, the basic peacekeeping budget, it hasn't affected that because peacekeeping budget is funded through assessed contribution. So once member states agree that the budget of peacekeeping is $7.1 billion, then that, that rate of assessment, they have to pay that uh, their shares uh, as required by the, uh, the UN Charter. Uh, I think we're out of time. I leave it to you, Professor Murphy, to close <coughs> the session from your end. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kamal. Thank you, Mr. Nasser. We have greatly appreciated the contribution of, of both your time and expertise. It has been very enlightening for all of us. I would just like to announce that if any of our participating universities would like to propose a topic or a desired UN speaker for an <coughs> fall, Please send an email to me, Joanne Murphy, at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and we will add that to our list of focus topics. Thank you very much, and have a great day. May I, on your behalf, on behalf of all the universities and on my own, thank Mr. Nasir for finding time thank out you. from his onerous duties as uh, the person at heading a large department to join us in this outreach uh, to students in seven universities. Until we meet again, goodbye from the Ambassadors Club at the United Nations. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.